of the builders yesterday. <laughs> and I, Bobby uh, uh, oldest daughter is uh, uh, over HR in a
Good morning, beautiful people. And I say you are beautiful people because you are God's people. So welcome to St. Andrews on this wonderful fall feeling morning. Doesn't it feel good out there? Lack of humidity. Um, and welcome as we continue to um, praise God for all of creation. What's next week? What's next Sunday? Homecoming. homecoming! One more week till homecoming! I'm so excited. It's my first homecoming here. And I hope that you have already contacted your friends and your neighbors and, and that everyone is just as excited as I am um, to fill this, this whole campus with love and worship and, and um, uh, love in ways that, that do nothing more than glorify God. And that's why we want to come together next week is to celebrate one another and glorify God. So please remember that we will have one service next week at 11 o'clock that will be in the sanctuary um, with Reverend Tim Russell as our guest preacher. So I'm super excited that, that Reverend Tim is able to be with us. Um, we'll also be serving you a catered lunch um, in, here in the Family Life Center. So this will be a buzzing place next Sunday morning, I'm sure, um, as we get ready for that lunch. Um, we, you're invited um, to offer a donation toward that lunch. Um, to help kind of offset that cost, but mostly we just want to be together and enjoy the day. So I'm excited for next week. The following week, we will have our Sunday afternoon blessing of the animals. So get your pets ready and um, tell all the, especially all the children that you know, because that's a fun time for them. And I hope that you'll watch for details um, on that throughout the week. So other announcements are available on the sheets that are there at your tables. But for now, I invite you to stand as you're able and share the peace of Christ with one another as we begin our time of worshiping together. Okay, as you make your way back to your places, let's begin to worship through the singing. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Play, Spirit, play, set our hearts. and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let them be light. Oh, the light of your love is shining, in the midst of the dark is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us. Jesus shine, fill this land with the 
the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nation with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine on me, shine Jesus, shine, fill this place with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar when the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one? Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar when the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. And we can see that God, you're moving a mighty river through the nations. And young and old will turn to Jesus. Fling wide your heavenly gaze. Prepare the way of the risen one. Open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring your hope, songs that bring you joy. Dancers who dance upon injustice. Do you feel the darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song? All the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness. And when we see that God, you're moving, a time of jubilee is coming. When young and old return to Jesus, Fling wide your heavenly gates, prepare the way of the risen Lord. Open up the doors and let the music play, let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring your Songs that bring your joy, dancers and dance upon injustice. Did you hear the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. All right, that was even better this time. <laughs> Water you turn into wine 
open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Against. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Please be seated. And as you shared peace with one another this morning, I, I'm sure some of you also share joy. And so I wonder if there are joys that you would like to share with the body this morning. Anybody have a joy? Hey. It's cooler. <laughs> Mary? Uh, yes, we took our kids back to the Smith Elementary the other day, and the counselor said sometimes children tell us what's wrong with them. They'll draw it. So our kids pack sketch pads and pencils and crayons, color pencils and a journal, and we pray that God will use that to remind you that mm. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Have a joy? Yeah. So um, do you have the names of those that you would like for us to cover in prayer? Thank you. Pray for Ben and Tina Garner. Tina is improving in her health, but Ben is really struggling with sciatic nerve problems mm, and back okay. problems. Okay, thank so we you. Did work on their okay, okay. okay. I um, want to remember Dennis has been in the hospital this week, and I talked with Mary last night, and the hope is that he'll be home today. There's the hope. So hoping to talk with her after, after worship today. Yeah. Actually, whoever's not here today, today's a slow crowd. <laughs> well, not a slow the crowd, the tears, right? <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Well, if there are no others, would you join me in praying? Holy God, our world is hurting in every way. 
injustice in the shadows and injustice in broad daylight, worship of wealth, worship of doctrine, homeless people under highways and hungry children in our schools. We're inflicted with things that seem so silly, like like stolen pensions, destabilized nations, politicians that are wined and dined and judges that are wooed and won. We don't understand exploding grenades and cherished grudges. God of our salvation, only you can help us. You see the hurt of all your people and sometimes we share your grief and we despair. Sometimes we're so used to the way things are that we scarcely notice. But one day or one night, one morning, maybe this morning, your pain, our pain, our world's pain hits us. And we call out to you asking if there's a healing for us. You are the God of our salvation. And only in you, in your tears born out of vast love, only in that way do we find hope. So open to us the way of your tears, the way that leads us back to your love. Teach us to serve you and you alone, that you may deliver and forgive and renew our world at last. We do confess that we oftentimes find your medicine hard to swallow. The quick fixes of this world are so much more pleasant, leaving us kind of free to go back to our usual routines. But your medicine's powerful. And if we take it, it will remake and and renew our lives. It will reorient us to you and to you alone. Turn us toward your love for justice and true worship. Lord, forgive our sins, the sins which make you weep. Forgive our hesitation and give us courage to choose you as our physician and to serve you and you alone for nothing we desire compares with you. You are more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds. You are the God of our salvation who weeps for us and for our world, our God who who desires everyone to be saved. And we claim that, that through the love of, of you, our one God and one mediator, we are forgiven. So this morning, Lord, assure us of our forgiveness, of our salvation, of your compassion, and of the hope that we find in you. Place your healing hands on those that we've named. Free them from illness and harm and devastation. Hear our cries for your intervention. At the same time, Lord, hear our shouts of praise for the healing that we've already received, for for the celebrations of life that we share with one another, and for the blessings that flow around us. For these are the precious things that we pray in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, um, what a lovely, lovely few weeks we have had in celebrating God's creation. And our space has been enhanced by beautiful worship banners. And, and our services have been enriched through prayer and, and the lifting up of global creation concerns. And so let's take a moment this morning again to hear from our creation care team. Or person. Or you want to be the team this morning? Okay. I think I'll just be a person this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, this is the month of creation care, and we've been trying to raise more awareness. And as you know, we're busy in our church in a small group working toward making us more viable. Um, Psalms 113.7 says that he raises the weak from the dust, and he raises the poor from the garbage heap. Well, listen to the voice of the earth, and the message would be that a, holy, that a healthy environment, and a holy one too, is grounded in the underlying principle that all humans have a basic non-negotiable need for clean air, clean water, clean soil, and a livable climate. And that humans have a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life, an environment that 
permits a, la a life of dignity and well-being. And for the first time ever, in October 2021, the UN passed a resolution that having a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a universal right. Well, environmental degradation disproportionately affects the poor, women and girls, indigenous people, persons with disabilities, and children. They are far more likely to be in the site of high-risk industry activity or else a waste dump. And so the low so lower social economic classes and communities have less green space, they have less tree canopy, they have more concrete, higher polluting industries, and higher heat islands than any other affluent neighbors, making them more impacted by the climate change. Isaiah said in chapter 41, the, and this is verses 17 through 19, the afflicted and the needy seek water in vain, their tongues are parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open up rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the broad valleys. I will turn the wilderness into a marshland and the dry ground into springs of water. In the wilderness, I will plant the cedar, acacia, myrtle, and olive. And in the wasteland, I will set the cypress and together with the plane tree and the pine. Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, 14, and 15 says, So stand fast with your loins girded in truth, clothed with righteousness as a breastplate, and your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. Well, this is indeed our home, home for everyone, but not just us, not humans, but also for every one of God's creatures and every form of life that God has created. We need to stand ready to speak up and out to those in power about all of our healthy environmental needs. Now, we will begin to educate and continue to educate from now on. And our church does meet some of these needs because we've been working on it. But as we follow Christ into the world, we need to listen and ask for God to speak to us and find the strength to act on what he calls us to do, each one individually and as a group. So we're going to go with Christ, and I hope we will learn to do. Pray with me, please. Lord, inspire your people to support those affected by an un unhealthy environment, those who struggle with unhealthy dust from nearby industries who need solidarity, those who have no clean drinking water in our country, so rich in rivers, who ask for your, our support, those who see the coastline under attack and the risk of their homes being washed away, those who are hungry and thirsty for justice, make this appeal for a healthy environment through you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, we read Jesus' story about a dishonest manager. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked first, how much do you owe my master? He answered a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. His master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the riches, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
Well, before we move to our second scripture reading, I want to remind you that, that Jesus told us just what we read. Whoever's faithful with little is also faithful in much. And this has been a little bit of a confusing scripture. It's one of the hardest that, that Jesus ever told, one of, the, one of the most difficult stories to kind of comprehend. But we'll get to that during the sermon. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But for right now, you know, you're invited to support St. Andrew's with your giving and your financial giving. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful in much. And um, that giving is used to spread the message of Jesus Christ and also, also to make a difference in the lives of others through our missions and our ministry. So you may um, visit the giving station there at the back um, this morning or be sure that the church office receives your tithes and your offerings. So as you give, be assured that we give thanks to God for your faithfulness. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we are given instructions concerning prayer. And Paul writes, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and acceptable before God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. There is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a while back, I was going through a, uh, and, and kind of emptying out an old cedar chest. You got those old chests at your house? We've got two or three of them. And I discovered some childhood treasures inside that chest. Matchbox cars and games. Um, I found a, it was one of the original Monopoly games with the original wooden pieces. Yeah? Um, really cool baseball cards from way back and, and all kinds of toys. And, and I still have, I personally still have my Donny Osmond posters from over 50 years ago. Yeah, when he was only 14, and I was much younger than, yeah. <laughs> and, and as I dug deeper, I found some memories from, from my teenage years. And it seems that as we grew older, my brother and I grew more sophisticated in our tastes. You know, we traded in the, the blocks and the dolls and the puppy love for posters of movie stars. And I, I found a first edition poster of, of the original Star Wars movie. And it was, in, it was in pretty good condition. Been in that cedar chest all these years. And I, I very carefully unrolled a, a, a very famous pose of Farrah Fawcett. Do you remember that? But the, the men are going, I remember that poster. <laughs> and that one once belonged to my brother. And he said he wanted it back immediately. Uh, and of course, there was my Sylvester Stallone. You know, poster that hung on my wall, and not the Rambo one, the real one, the Rocky one. Um, and I also found an old 45 recording of John Travolta. And this is, this is back in the Vinnie Barbarino days, way before Greece, and any, years before any of the other movies that he made. And while remembering how important these figures had been to our growing up years, I was also taken aback a little bit at the memory of just how important these things had been. You know, I've, you know, I've never met Malone, uh, Stallone, um, but he was what my friends and I talked about. Um, and, and I, I think that I saw that first Rocky movie seven times. That was what was important. I know that I'm never going to run into John Travolta in real person, but as many times as I played that song, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the record still has grooves in it. You know, and, and my friends and all knew all of the words all of them. We spent hours and hours listening over and over to that same tune. You know, we thought these things were the most important things in life. And, and while I hope that I maintained a functional relationship with Jesus during those years, I know for many of my friends who did not have a church foundation, these important things and these important people became sort of like God's to them. My friends at school were drawn in and they craved personal relationship with their God's. You know, they, the, my girlfriends dreamed of relationship with movie stars. 
You know, back in the first century, in, in biblical times that we call it, the most important things in life had kind of taken on a similar feel to, to that memory for me. And, you know, for, for about 500 years, you know, Rome had been governed by elected officials. Um, under Jesus, Julius Caesar, though, that changed. And Rome moved from being a republic to being ruled under an imperial system. It's very different. And that means that there's now one ruler. There's the emperor, namely Julius Caesar. Um, and about 30 years or so before Jesus was born, Julius Caesar w is assassinated. And it isn't long after that that he is proclaimed as a god after his death. Um, and the people immediately kind of latch on to this idea. Julius Caesar is named one of the gods of the state. And it becomes a custom to worship him. Um, people are worshiping and praying to the Caesars, the rulers, throughout the entire Roman Empire. And they're, they're, they're kind of drawn in and they crave this personal relationship with these gods. You know, that's the culture into which Jesus was born. And that's the backdrop for Paul's letter to Timothy. So that's what's kind of going on in the political and the, and the, and the, and the world um, when we drop in as Christians looking back on it, we kind of drop into this, this scenario. And when Paul writes to Timothy, he writes, first of all, and, and this, isn't, this isn't the beginning of a list. This is, uh, Paul's not going to write, do this first and then do this second and so on. Paul is saying, first of all, primarily, most importantly, he's saying, first of all, I want you to pray. Pray in every way that you know how. Pray for everyone, for kings, for, for all who are in high positions, and, and, and listen there, he says four kings, not two kings. Pray four kings. We're not, we're not praying two kings. So we already, in, in Paul's letter right here, we have a brand new meaning for the people. Paul is saying that the, these rulers are not divine. They are not gods. They are not to be worshipped. And they need the one true God just like the rest of us. This is huge in this time period. This is Paul taking the leadership down several notches. This is Paul calling us to pray for our leaders and for our governments to, to rule well so that we can lead very quiet and, and peaceable lives in, in all godliness and in dignity. You know, Paul says this is, this is right and acceptable behavior um, in the sight of, of, of our God and our Savior. You know, this is the way that our Savior God wants us to live. God wants all of us, every one, um, rulers and government officials and all of these people, every single one, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Can you imagine? I just want to step out of that for a second. Can you imagine the powerful changes that would come about in this country and, and, and throughout the world if every single follower of Jesus stopped everything and prayed for our leaders and our governments. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? And, and if changing the world seems to be too big of a place for, for us to start, then, then let's bring it a little closer to home. Can you imagine the powerful changes that would come about in this church? If we committed to things like, oh, I don't know, eliminating complaints, may, may, oh, there are a couple of giggles out there, um, and, and started praying for our church leadership, and I'm not talking about just me, you know, I, I have told you before, you want a better pastor, pray for the one you have, um, but, it, but praying for those who are in the decision-making spots, you know, pray for our church leadership. I was, I was telling one of you, and I cannot remember which one of you I was telling, I got to tell you people, I, we went to lunch the other day, and when I got back from lunch, I had 22 new emails just from church members. You guys are busy people. It is so much fun being here. Um, but I was telling somebody, I don't know if it was you or somebody, in, in, that I, was, uh, um, I was telling about a meeting that I was in several years ago. It must have been early in 2017. And if you'll remember, a new president was in office, just taken office in January of 2017. And I was meeting with a bunch of clergy in a, in, a, in a group meeting, and the conversation turned very political. Being the 
the safe space that it was intended to be. You know, I, I think a few of the pastors there felt comfortable saying exactly what they thought about our governmental leadership. And after several, several of these preachers and from all different walks of life, we were, we were coming, it was very ecumenical um, group uh, a gathering. It wasn't just a United Methodist group, but after several unfavorable comments about the way our president had treated women, um, one of the pastors said, if that man walked through that door right this minute, I wouldn't even shake his hand. And there were nods and agreements throughout the room and until I broke my silence. Now y'all know that I will go out of my way to avoid political conversations not going to talk about it. It's not my job to influence how you interpret the effectiveness of our government. You know, it's not my role to create division among God's people. I believe my job is to encourage you to be truthfully informed and prayerfully decisive. You know, so, but being the only female in the room in that moment, it seemed that my, my male colleagues and my friends were kind of trying to be protective of me in some way and were even expecting me to jump on board with this president bashing wagon you know and when my when my preacher friend said that he would not even shake the president's hand I quietly said I would and I have to tell you the silence was just as deafening as it is right now and after a few minutes of pure shock on that man's face my, oh my precious friend after a few minutes of shock my clergy colleague friend he just kind of stammered. He said, you would? And I said, of course I would. How can I talk to someone about Jesus if I won't even shake his hand? Friends, that's not a political commentary in any way. That's not throwing my support in one direction or another politically or governmentally or whatever you want to call it. That's simply recognizing that we have work to do. And it's not always easy. This is why Paul goes on to talk about one God and one mediator, Christ Jesus, who, what do you, who offered himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin to set them all free. That's what we just read. You know, Paul says eventually the news is going to get out. It's, it's going to get out. His job is to help spread the news to those who have never heard of God, the one true God. You know, we have the same job. This isn't unique to Paul's calling, explaining how it all works by, by simple faith and plain truth. That's what we're all to be doing. We're created to be drawn in and to crave a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, who is divine. You know, we begin by praying. And not, not praying for what we want, but praying that God will use the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And then we, and then we continue by sharing our faith. It's, it's, we say it's not that easy, Hmm, I think it might be a little bit easy. We just talk about our faith. We just talk about our lives. We share our lives with other people. The story, I got to tell you, the story over there that, that Jesus told in, in the Gospel of Luke, that's one of the most confusing stories that he tells. Would you agree? Yeah, it, it is, isn't it? You know, there are all kinds of interpretations surrounding this story, but I just want to tell you what I think, you know, and what I think we need to hear. This, this, this rich man rich, rich man, this wealthy man, he has this manager who's kind of taking advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses. And so, so he fires his manager and he says, I want a complete audit of your books. Well, the manager kind of panics. He doesn't really know what to do. He's lost his job. He's not strong enough for physical labor. He's too proud to beg. So he comes up with a plan so that when he is turned out into the street, people will take him into their houses because he's made friends with them. And he begins to reduce the debts that people owe to the rich guy. Jesus said to his followers, now here's a surprise, the master praises the crooked manager. And why, why does he do that? Because he knows how to look after himself. Now he says streetwise people are, are kind of better at this. They're smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens are. They, they're on this constant alert, and they're, they're looking for angles, and they're surviving by their wits. Okay? See, the manager isn't being praised for looking out for himself. He's commended for being wise about his future, just as Jesus wants us to be wise about our future. 
Jesus says, I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right, using every difficulty to kind of kindle a fire within you. You know, I want you to survive creatively, um, to concentrate your, your attention on the bare essentials so that you'll live and really live and not just, not just complacently get by on, on, on good behavior. The manager had lost his status and he got creative so that he and others benefited in the end. You know, he'd come to realize that status is temporary and you can see that by looking at the church today. You know, we can no longer ignore that, that we, the, the, we meaning the worldwide church, the universal church, the big church, big capital C church, everybody, we, the universal church, we are in crisis. The church is in crisis. We cannot continue to try hanging on to the status of our past. We have to be shrewd. We have to work within the framework of today's world, recognizing where hope is missing and share the good news of the gospel message there. Is that man that's living in a tent off of Highway 70? You know, he's within yards of several restaurants, but he doesn't have food. You know, a single mother with two children living in her car, these are true stories, by the way, um, didn't have shelter from the recent storms. Uh, the women living in hiding from abusive spouses are trying to get into the workplace in this country, but they have no appropriate clothes to wear to interviews. The, the children next, next door, yeah, I <laughs> turn around in here. The children next door at Smith Elementary, they, that child can't read because she's more focused on her tummy grumbling. She's not suffering from hunger, she's hungry. That, you know, that veteran that lives down off of Timber Drive can't get to his doctor's appointment because it takes gas to run the car, to get to the VA. You know, it's, it just, and it, the lists go on and on and on. What if someday, what if someday these are the people who are standing at the gates of heaven to welcome us? Huh, church, this, this work we're called into is not that easy, but change never is. We're being required to change. We just get, you know, sitting in the seats and waiting for people to come on in and ask to join us church people. You know, that, you know that's right along the lines of worshiping Caesar. You know, refusing to shake someone's hand or, or, or idolizing people in wall posters. The heart change required of us is to recognize our gift of life and to recognize our blessings of abundance, and to recognize the limitations of earthly riches, and then share our wealth with other people. Handling our own wealth in, in whatever form that takes. You know, maybe, maybe that, that, that takes the, the form of wisdom, or maybe it takes the form, uh, or maybe it takes the form of status, I don't know, but you know, in whatever form that takes, that's the training ground for handling larger assignments from God. No, it's not that easy. Change is hard, but it's faithful. And the heart change that comes about when we are dedicated, a, a dedicated praying people who are smart about our future, you know, those changes make eternal differences. So now will you, will you pray with me? Let's pray together now. Holy God, we want to be a changed and praying people. We want to understand that prayer is the best thing that we can offer. Prayer for ourselves, for others, for leaders, it's not that easy. But we want the change of heart that, that we know comes from allowing your Holy Spirit to blow within us. So thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for using us. And thank you for the changes that are gifts from you. May we be your people who share your love throughout this community and beyond. Amen. Will the servers and the singers um, come as we approach the table of our Lord?
Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God as we pray. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You're raised from the dead, that same Jesus who now rules with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we remember these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking from this cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, freed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And all God's people say, amen. Well, the table is set and you are invited to the feast. You may come from your seat for a piece of the common loaf to dip in the common cup, or you may ask us to come to you where you sit. Um, and we also have a basket that's being passed around with the individually sealed portions. But as the music plays, follow your heart and come. Truly the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on his face. Truly the presence of the Lord is in this place. In the midst of his children, the Lord said he would be. It doesn't take very many. It could be just two or three. And I feel that same sweet spirit that I felt on times before. Surely I can say that I've been with the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, eternal God, for the gifts of this time and this feast. May you continue to work in our hearts, and may we continue to be blessed in furthering the work of your kingdom. Amen. Well, I invite you to continue to stand as you're able for the blessing. So now go and continue to offer prayers and thanksgiving to everyone. Be shrewd in dealing with the world around you, but don't be seduced into serving wealth. Weep for those who suffer and share faith and truth to all. And may God welcome you with love. May Christ Jesus give you knowledge of the truth. And may the Holy Spirit lead you into all godliness and dignity. Go in peace. 
to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. The time has come, O Lord, for us to leave this place. Guide us and protect us, and lead us in thy grace. Wherever life may take us, as we go our separate ways, help us share with others the things we've shared today. Peace of God the Father and the love of Christ the Son. Guide us in the days ahead and strengthen us each one. May the blessings of the Spirit fill us from within. God bless us 